Hi friends, thanks for coming back. I love the game Civilization, but unsurprisingly, it's not really accurate. States didn't send out settlers to claim land on their behalf, at least not the early states, as far as we know. A more realistic game would be where you start with your own place, you have to organize violence and enslave everybody else, become the local king, then send out troops to conquer and, over time, assimilate other settlements. That is the true history of the state. And I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. If you really want to understand something, look at its history. To understand the history of the state, imagine the following. And to be clear, I'm not trying to romanticize the past just to explain the origin of the state. You live in a village with about a hundred other people. You live an idyllic life. You share things with others in your village. Some grow food, some gather, some hunt, but everyone's working for everyone else. There might be the occasional scrap with other bands or neighboring villages, but probably nothing major. You might even have found a way to avoid all violence through reconciliation. Then one day, a group of people come along and demand that you give them the surplus of your labor. In this case, food. They haven't worked for it. Where do they get off demanding? We can share if you like, but then we'll share in the work too, right? No. They want you to produce for them, and they will take as much of it as they like. Someone says no, they kill that person, and say if anyone else objects to this forced labor, they're next. Forced labor and taxation, or the taking of the product of another person's labor, is inherent in all states. States also always create a class system. The people who control the state are the ruling class. So you be begin producing for people you don't even like. They might come around threatening you regularly, maybe killing someone or something else just, just to keep the fear alive in you. They decide they want more slaves, more territory, more of everything, so they conscript you. You're now a soldier, working for them in a different capacity. It's still forced, so it's still slavery, but now you are unwittingly help them expand their power. And they do. They expand to all the surrounding villages, killing, pillaging, and so on. That is the origin of the state in a nutshell. Over the years, kingdoms and empires that became states grew larger. They started taking over not just the product of their subjects' labor, but other aspects of life, too. They destroy your system of rules and implement their laws. They make you start using money that you never needed putting you in competition with other people, which you didn't need either. They put your children in an indoctrination center so that your old values and language and ways of life all die out. Propaganda becomes gradually more sophisticated so that over a few generations, no one even notices the ruling class have created a world of illusion that suits them. No one remembers a time when there were no rulers. Everything seems normal and even necessary. Of course, we need those people taking our food and telling us what to think. How could society possibly function without them? Now, depending on your definitions, and of course there's a lot of scholarly debate on this topic, the early states that the modern state grew out of weren't actually states. They might have been kingdoms or empires, but the state as we know it is a more modern invention. Uh, in the book War and the Rise of the State, Bruce Porter explains that those were primitive or proto-states, and the state itself really began around 800 years ago in Western Europe. I don't 
know how useful it is to make those distinctions. Um, what the older states did was use violence and the threat of violence to take from people and constantly expand their influence however they could. The modern state is not different from that. Gandhi once said, the state represents violence in a concentrated and organized form. The individual has a soul, but as the state is a soulless machine, it can never be weaned from violence to which it owes its very existence. Uh, Max Weber, the sociologist very influential about a hundred years ago, defined the state as that organization or institution that has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force within a given territory, nowadays a national territory. That's the definition most people use of the state. Um, what did he mean by legitimate? Well, surely, ultimately, legitimacy is in the eye of the beholder. Something is legitimate to me if I say it's legitimate. If you agree, it's legitimate for you too. I don't really agree with people who, who say the majority of the population, or even just a plurality of voters, can decide for you what's legitimate. The only other thing I think legitimate could mean in this definition is legal. And since the state decides what's legal, it legitimates itself. So saying that just begs the question. Albert J. Nock countered Weber by saying the state claims and exercises a monopoly of crime over its territory. So statism is the belief that this monopoly of crime is good or necessary. David S. D'Amato explains its effect. The state's principal manner of acting is to make peaceful interactions crimes while protecting the institutional crime of ruling class elites. After all, what does the state do? It steals, but it calls its theft taxation. It kidnaps, but it calls kidnapping arrest. It uses force and compulsion and just calls it the rule of law and pretends that the law is equal for everybody. It commits murder on a wide scale but prefers such terms as war, execution, and the consequences of resisting arrest. The state claims to act to protect person and property, but in practice it claims ownership of both. Though, through, through for instance, uh, through laws telling you what you can and can't put in your own body. It claims to protect freedom while taking it away. It claims to aid the less fortunate when, in fact, it benefits the powerful at the expense of everyone else, often grinding the less fortunate into ever deeper poverty and misery. If I go to another country to kill people that I don't know, I'm a murderer. When the military does it, it's fighting terrorism and promoting democracy. This Sleight of hand and clouding of truth is how the state manufactures legitimacy. Whoever tells you the state was created by some voluntary agreement among its subjects to solve some problem knows nothing of its history. No state has ever been created by voluntary agreement of its subjects. The state has never asked for consent. The same is true of this assumption that we gave them their powers. Again, this is a lie. The state took power and has granted itself every power it has. With the occasional exception, maybe Switzerland, it has never asked us. This is not our failing to prevent something but being weaker and less organized than those who wield power over us. People who say the failings, i.e. the consequences of the state, are the fault of common people for failing to prevent it, are gaslighting you. They remind me of religious people who credit God 
with everything that's good in the world and human free will with everything bad. It's just too convenient. Yet the state, uh, or at least the concentrated force the modern state grew out of, is responsible for poverty. It forcibly split people into haves and have-nots. We were once all haves. The abundance of nature was available to everyone. But that changed when people were enslaved. There was now an underclass who had less nutrition, freedom, and leisure time. Wealth was the outcome. Ever since then, the state has facilitated, often by law, the transfer of resources from the underclass to the upper class. And that's how wealth is created. If you doubt that claim, ask the wealthy where their money came from. It may have been created by destroying nature, perhaps someone's ancestral homeland, but the rich don't care. Their wealth might have been created by taking the surplus of others' labor, keeping it for themselves what they didn't create, and forcing everyone else to work for endless hours if they want to eat. This system of forced labor was and is designed by the rich and implemented by the state. Or perhaps they got rich by fencing off or monopolizing some land or other resource, say insulin, also frequently through laws backed up by police violence. Monopolizing something means no one else can have it unless they have permission. But who gave them permission to fence off productive land or create corporations or implement intellectual property laws? The state gave itself that power. Monopolies can only be maintained by force. And where did the state get permission to grant monopolies? It gave itself permission. It doesn't wait for consent. That is how power works. And the state is the concentration of power. The state pursues petty criminals partly because they threaten the stability of the state, the, the system that the state has erected, and the security of the wealthy, but at least as much because it claims a monopoly of crime. Mafia organizations are even more dangerous, as they pose a more fundamental threat to the state as competitors for plunder and dominance. So the state is the government, i.e. the ruling party and some top bureaucrats, but it's also the military, police, intelligence, and nowadays a whole bunch of other agencies. And because the state is ultimately controlled by the rich, it doesn't matter what the intentions of the people who work for it are. If you enter the lion's den, it doesn't matter if you enter with love in your heart. The lion has its own plans for you. I might also consider the people behind the scenes who pull the strings part of the state. For example, what might be called the what has been called the US foreign policy establishment is not merely members of the state and defense departments. It includes high-ranking business people, executives, directors and shareholders in large oil companies, for example, just one. So they're not all oil companies. Um, probably have far greater influence over the use of the U.S. military than, say, one or two senators taking stands against war. It includes the Council on Foreign Relations and other influential think tanks, academics, and so-called consultants who are often retired officers who own stock in some beneficiary of the Pentagon budget, uh, affiliated with those who craft U.S. foreign policy. Intelligence agencies, and not only in the U.S. government, influence the processes as well. Andrew J. Basevich, an excellent writer and not a uh, libertarian of any kind, points out that military-industrial complex no longer suffices to describe the conjuries of interest profiting from and committed to preserving the national security status quo. But 
but that's one definition. Maybe to include influencers rather than just officials might be stretching the definition too far. It might be more useful to see the foreign policy establishment as a network connected to, but not exclusively part of, the state. Either way, the process of shaping policy and making legislation is not in the hands of the voters. And, and you know it's the politicians who aren't in charge because of the faces of the state change, but the clear continuity of U.S. foreign policy reflects the interests of those truly in power. The same is true to one extent or another for all areas the state attempts to control. There are similar networks for every type of policy. And that's because the rich and well-connected know how to use the state's powers to enhance their own. <clears throat> the state's raison d'etre has had different pretexts as times have changed. It was originally just a tool for conquering and controlling territory around a kingdom. Uh, social, social scientists sorry, studying the emergence of states note that the state began with the divine right of kings. The sovereign or uh, totalitarian king kept his subjects in awe of the wrath of gods. Franz Oppenheimer, uh, in his sociological survey of the state, describes its origins. The state, completely in its genesis, essentially and almost completely during the first stages of its existence, is a social institution forced by a victorious group of men on a defeated group with the sole purpose of regulating the dominion of the victorious group over the vanquished and securing itself against revolt from within and attacks from abroad. Teleologically, this dominion had no other purpose than the economic exploitation of the vanquished by the victors. No primitive state known to history originated in any other manner. Mm -hmm. so, so a tribe with elders or a chiefdom may be a, a slight hierarchy or sometimes even a rigid one, but it's not a state. European states fought each other and expanded their territory. Then later, as they grew in technological power, they spread outside Europe as overseas empires. The ambition of conquering and subjugating the weak had not ended. To demarcate they, their possessions, states drew lines on maps after they had filled them in. Countries are only countries today because of the, because of the movements of empires and their possessions. States are products of conquest. Borders are the geographic limits to the power of individual states. But of course, states work together a lot nowadays, and their power isn't just national. States owe their existence and their growth to war. That is why Randolph Bourne called war the health of the state, and Charles Tilley said, war made the state and the state made war. An empire is simply the growth of a state beyond its previous borders. And because the European empires left behind structures that would continue to benefit themselves, it's not surprising that most post-colonial states still have economies that privilege a few, including foreign banks and local elites on the backs of the many. The liberation of most of the world from the colonial yoke was heralded as a new era of freedom, but in most cases results have been really disappointing. Government by locals and foreigners alike, or especially the two in cahoots, leaves the governed wide open to abuse. Today, states are still about a monopoly of crime over a given territory, but for a variety of reasons, the state does more things now. The modern state is partly a result of the norms of what the state is supposed to be since different times in the 20th century. So, for example, all states nowadays are expected to pro provide schools, but also hospitals, power, roads, and other infrastructure. All kinds of things. 
due in part to a century or more of pressure from uh, mostly syndicalists, anarcho-syndicalist unions, and other activists, um, and the supposed alternative to capitalism in the USSR, Western states felt compelled to mitigate the worst aspects of capitalism and introduce the eight-hour workday, the five-day work week, breaks, vacation time, and so on. Some historians do say that those measures like the New Deal saved capitalism from workers' revolution. It's now expected that since society is rich enough to afford education, housing, health care, and so on for everything, those things must be provided by the state, the institution with the most resources, after all. The only reason people believe the state is necessary for social programs, scientific research, relations with other states, and so on, is because it has taken on those functions. The state does not exist to provide social programs. It provides social programs so it can continue to exist. The state is not about social programs and emergency rescue. It is about domination power over others. People who believe otherwise, they don't know how to think like a state. So let's try that. What does the state want? In a word, power. Power could be defined simply as the ability to enforce one's will on another. A further definition could be the ability to carry out violence on another if necessary to get one's way. So, an abusive husband and father is violence on a family level. The modern state threatens and employs violence on a local, national, and even global level. Its power to carry out violence everywhere exists in the form of local, national, and international police, armies, navies, air forces, spy drones, national guards, and special branches, intelligence services, surveillance cameras, wiretapping, reading mail, reading email, reading instant messages and collecting data on everyone, and spy satellites just in case you try to escape Earth without authorization. The state has evolved from the small confines of localities to go global. It has a measure of power over us everywhere we go, as the threat of violence always looms over our heads. So the state is a monopoly on force, but now it's taken on other monopolies over time. Modern states came to control land, the money supply, infrastructure, and the security of the streets. As it's grown, the state has created new monopolies and oligopolies. Having a monopoly on the provision of law, it's created corporations, which relieve their owners and operators of responsibility for their actions. It's granted patents, enabling some of the biggest corporations, from Disney to the pharmaceutical giants, to attain their current size and power. And it's used complicated and unnecessary regulations, tax codes, and barriers to foreign trade to prevent competition for the big players in the market. Thus, it creates monopolies. Monopolies promote abuse because they grant power, and power corrupts. Thinking like the state means understanding it expands its power in every direction by every means. If it can close a loophole enabling a citizen's freedom, it usually does. If it can write a new loophole for its friends, it does. But instead of thinking like a state, most of us just think the way we're told. Edward Bernays one of the pioneers of modern propaganda, said, The voice of the people expresses the mind of the people, and that mind is made up for it by the group leaders in whom it believes and by those persons who understand the manipulation of public opinion. It is composed of inherited prejudices and symbols and cliches and verbal formulas supplied them by their leaders. <clears throat> or maybe you could put it another way, you could put it as George Carlin said, 
They don't want a population capable of critical thinking. They want obedient workers. People just smart enough to run the machines and just dumb enough to passively accept their condition. And we do. A very subtle power the state has is its ability to shape our thinking, but be sure it is a power nonetheless. Through its control of primary and secondary education, its influence over academia and the media, the state sets the agenda for what we are to think and believe. The prevailing norms of any state society are those that benefit the ruling class until that brief interval of revolution which usually so far has led back to statism. As such, the ideal citizen is one who believes they think for themselves, but do not. Our socialization comes to a great extent from the state. The ruling class has certain ideas it benefits from, like statism, capitalism, nationalism, militarism, consumerism, fear of the other, and to a, to a lesser extent nowadays, religion. We're surrounded by these ideas and bombarded with evidence that they're correct. As such, we take so many things as given that we have considerable trouble thinking independently. But those who are told they're free believe it, while they fall in line with the orthodoxy of the ruling class without question. They come to love the symbols of the state, the flags, the uniforms, the songs, the slogans, the language of family, honor, duty, and sacrifice. They come to think of themselves as representing the family of the nation, rather than the institutions of the state. They chastise those who go against the truth they've been given. How dare you question democracy or the constitution? You're unpatriotic! One of my favorite lines from the book 1984 is, quote, Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. On the other hand, people who don't follow conventions are bad people. Bad citizens. H.L. Mencken described those people. The most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself without regard to the prevailing superstitions and taboos. Almost inevitably, he comes to the conclusion that the government he lives under is dishonest, insane, and intolerable. And so, if he's romantic, he tries to change it. And even if he is not romantic personally, he's very apt to spread discontent among those who are. The state exists to establish a social order that benefits the ruling class, protect that class and its property, expand its power and wealth wherever possible, fool the people it rules into believing this is all for their own good, and subdue those who do anything counter to its interests. I think we need more bad citizens and less state. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. See you next Saturday.